Nancy Ruben Stewart is an award-winning author and journalist whose books include, the re in addition to the Muse of the Revolution and Defiant Brides, The Reluctant Spiritualist, The Life of Maggie Fox, American Empress, The Life and Times of Marjorie Merriweather Fox, The, the Mother Mirror, How a Generation of Women is Changing Motherhood in America, The New Suburban Woman, Beyond Myth and Motherhood, and Isabella of Castile, The First Renaissance Queen. The many publications Nancy has written for include the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Barnstable Patriot, the Huffington Post, and such magazines as McCall's Family Circle, American History, and Travel and Leisure. A graduate of Tufts University with a BA in English and an MAT from Brown University, Nancy holds an honorary doctorate in main letters from Mount Vernon College, which is now part of Georgetown University. She is a board member of the Women Writing Women's Lives Seminar for the Graduate Center of the City of New York City, and serves as an executive director of the Cape Cod Writers Center. Please welcome back Nancy Rubin It's a pleasure to be back here. I feel like I'm back with old friends. Uh, wonderful place, I think it's dome. Before we begin with the slide part of the show, I just want to tell you what people say to me. Why did you write an 80,000 word book? on two women who really aren't that very long in history. And I give them two words to explain it. And the first one is curiosity. You know there are a million and a half, uh, two, sorry, you know there were two and a half million people who were living at the time of the American Revolution. Well, I figure maybe 50%, maybe less, but let's say at least a million of them were women. We have very, very little that we know about those women. In fact, if you think about the American Revolution, I'm sure that you can mention right now, and maybe put your hand up or call out, maybe you can mention five or ten men who are significant to the American. <laughs> the point is that we really don't know that much beyond those women. And even some of them have been mentioned, we don't know that much about. Um, so what happened to them? Here we had at least a million women. Many of those number of them could write, and they read. Yes, we have some diaries that could be scanned. That was the second, so that was my curiosity. There had to be some accounts. And the second one, which was right as always again, is coincidence. So in rummaging around through archives, I came across correspondence of two women, and the coincidence was striking. They, they married five years apart. They were both 18. They were both from wealthy Tory or at least neutralist families, and they both defied their parents, and they married radical patriots. And I thought, well, I just can't resist this. This is the signals I'm on high. The writers must proceed. And that is, that is why and how uh, I began um, with this book, Defiant Bride. So without further ado, to get my thing going here, I'd like to tell you about Defiant Brides. Okay. Um, they, uh, they were teenagers, I say, and they married radical patriots. And the first was the attractive brunette Bostonian Lucy Fluger Flucker, who married bookbinder Henry Knox in 1774. And the second was Peggy <coughs> Shippen. She was a gorgeous Philadelphia belle, blonde hair, and she married the then military hero Benedict Arnold. Their lives were forever changed by those marriages. One bride became a patriot, the other one became a spy. Well, you all here and know just a wee bit about history, and I suspect a lot more, so I'm not going to bore you, but as you know, in the 1760s, there were rumblings of revolution. Many people, the word revolution really was only maybe about small places, small groups, but all of these terrible things that were happening with the British and the oppression began to heat up because the Sons of, of uh, Liberty and other groups, uh, you know, organized, and, but by, by 1770, that movement had kind of, kind of failed to drag down. Uh, and then, lo and behold, the Boston Massacre was just one more spark. And now we weren't talking about negotiating so much with the British, but rather we're hearing the words independence and revolution for the first time in, you know, everywhere. Beginning to become a lot more popular concept among the American uh, colonists. Um, but again, um, again, a number of years before that happens, and again, I won't go through them all, uh, maybe one of the most famous, of course, is the Tea Act, the Boston Tea Party, calling that, of course, uh, all of the intolerable acts uh, that followed, uh, that really, um, that, that did it, uh, 
independence became, I won't say a national cry, but a majority cry in this country. And the Royal Court of Boston at that time was the largest and busiest court. It's probably no coincidence that the cradle of, of uh, revolution, the cradle of liberty, happened here. And of course, here we have the Boston Tea Party. This is an engraving in that period. And one of the many political cartoons that will show you that this is an American savage. Okay, this is the way we're pictured. Force fed to drink this tea by the British. Uh, Lucy's father was Thomas Flucker, Royal Secretary of the Province of Massachusetts, obviously a crown appointment, and I love coffee because I think he's a great psychologist. And uh, what do you get from this picture of, um, of um, Mr. Flucker? What do you think he's like? Yeah, okay. And, and uh, yes, indeed. He was horrified that Lucy had thought about marrying this poor old friend of the boss. We don't know that much about Lucy's mother. She was Anna Waldo Flucker. Uh, she was heiress to the Waldo Patton in the District of Maine, and some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Waldo County, and Waldo Borough, and there's a whole bunch of other places that are just part of this vast tracts of land in uh, Maine. I don't know a lot about her, except Lucy was much closer to her than she was to her father. And of course, Henry. This is one of the most flattering pictures of Henry. <laughs> he still looks very handsome here. And there are accounts he was a handsome, tall, strapping man. Uh, he was orphaned uh, at age 12. His father was a shipmaster who died, plunging the family into poverty. Henry was apprenticed to a printer and then later became a bookstore owner and bookbinder. Uh, his New London bookstore was, uh, was on Corn Hill in Boston. And, uh, it became a fashionable salon and uh, a place where John Adams, young John Adams, Daniel Green, Paul Revere, and others hung out, as well as, of course, some of the ladies. Uh, and Lucy met him because she uh, saw him parading in the Boston militia and uh, fell instantly in love with him and began hanging around at age 16 at the New London bookstore. And Henry became absolutely enchanted with her. She was a voluptuous young woman, spirited, brainy. And bookish. She was well educated, obviously very fancy, elite background, um, but very spirited. I always tell audiences that she got to think about her as sort of a combination of, um, let's say, Oprah um, and, um, well, Rosie O'Donnell uh, and Margaret Thatcher. And put those three together, you got Lucy Knox. And she's a drama queen in New York City. So I certainly see, as I went through the archive, and I've seen a bit of that here. Well, as I say, she met Henry Knox in August 1773 near her father's stately townhouse, which is no longer there. This is just a townhouse I put up for the purposes of power. And her parents said, if you marry this common man in trade, you will forever live in poverty and you will eat the bread of dependence. And Lucy didn't care. So on June 14, 1774, she marries Henry Knox at King's Chapel. Uh, some of you have been there. This is what, of course, made it ill, but the great of the time, and the chapel, of course, what it looks like today. She married him there in an evening ceremony. Her parents left town. And things weren't so good between the young married couple and the fluckers after that. But then, of course, we had April 19, 1775, and the shot that was heard around the world, Lexington conquered, and um, Henry, as you know, I'm sure, was a radical patriot, and uh, he was all for this. However, he and Lucy are now trapped in occupied Boston. And the British skirmishes continued through that whole spring, uh, through the spring of 1775. And General Thomas Gage, commander of the British forces in North America, knew uh, Thomas Flucker, Lucy's father, and he thought Henry was a bright young man uh, with great promise that he would be a wonderful British soldier. So it was, he was told, young Henry was told, that if he tried to escape from Boston, if he, if he did that, he would be imprisoned. But Lucy and Henry were a strong-minded couple. And the story goes that she quilted, I use the word in quotes, she quilted his sword into her cape, into his cape, into her cape, and they got on horseback and they galloped away to Cambridge on a moonless night, arriving at Washington's army. 
Henry was um, 26 at the time. Lucy was by then almost 19. Uh, Washington became very impressed with Henry because Henry didn't have his books from his bookstore, but he was a great reader, self-educated, uh, and had many, many books on British armaments and fortifications and gunnery. And he, he didn't have them, but he remembered them. He was very clever. And so he began to design fortifications and some armaments and some strategic barricades and things. Both at Bunker Hill, although well, that's not played out very much in the literature I've read, but particularly in Roxbury to sort of keep the British from going any further. And Washington inspects them becomes very impressed with Henry. And um, by, by October of 1775, he's made a colonel in the army, the youngest in the Continental Army, quite young, actually, anyway. Lucy, of course, um, Lucy uh, has been living in a safe house in Watertown. Her parents are not writing to her. She keeps writing to them. She never hears from them, and she has not seen them since Lexington conquered Bay, well, since they escaped. And she's heartbroken. Uh, and also, she is pregnant. Of course, they have no money, absolutely no money. She does come in the fall, and I don't know where, and I wish I did, Jim, uh, here to, to Worcester. There were many, many, uh, as you know, not just Isaiah Thomas, but many, many uh, other patriots who fled Boston, fled the area, and, and especially women, and came here uh, to be in a safer area away from the British. So she lived here for quite a while. I'd love to know where. <coughs> A uh, much later picture of him. <laughs> and I think it's still rather flattering from the records that I've read. Henry at one time gets to be 290 pounds. Okay. But anyway, this is a much later picture. Billy Stewart, done in 1803. And of course, you have the cannon because he becomes the chief of artillery. He becomes absolutely Washington's right hand man. Washington, he is very, very friendly. Uh, and of course, Washington and Martha. Uh, and Lucy and Henry become very good friends, too. Well, Washington has a little chore for Henry, uh, now that he's colonel, and that is to go up to Ticonderoga, where the British had been defeated, and get the guns. And you know the story. We all have read it in high school, and probably read it again 14 times. Uh, but he does. It's a famous uh, trudge up there, and there's no snow, and it's, not, it's muddy, and he can't get the sleds to go, and they finally gets cold enough, and they pierce the ice to make more ice. And pretty soon he gets uh, oxen teams and, and patriots up there. And of course, this is a much later picture of bringing those guns down. Uh, 43 cannon and 15 heavy guns um, right down Massachusetts Avenue. Um, now, as I say, they, they are a wonderful love story. They really are. They write passionate letters to each other throughout their lives. And um, Lucy, of course, is always wishing to be with Henry. She does not have family anymore. She's always living in somebody else's house or in a safe house. But Lucy's an elitist. You have to remember, she grew up in a fairly affluent situation and is not too happy about mixing with other people ever. This never changes for Lucy. But most of all, she wants to be with Henry. It's her love. And she always says, she writes to him. And her letters, and their letters are very touching. He's always in my thoughts. Uh, his, his image is deeply imprinted in my heart. Uh, he was a man, in one moment here, but I don't mean to be funny, lucidity. And, and uh, she says, whom I love too much for my peace. So she's always worried about him, but she thinks, well, maybe she should be more of an independent person. And Henry, Henry's charming. Henry is brave, smart, gregarious, intelligent. There are some things about Henry that are less than attractive. But um, he, he's almost universally loved everywhere. There are wonderful comments uh, from all of the army and from the French uh, who come and help. Uh, it goes on and on. But Henry is, is a great lover. And he, he, he has one problem, and that is he's torn. And this is his signature problem throughout the, the revolution, the eight years of the revolution. I wish to render my dear country every service in my power, he writes. It's just typical. This is one of many of his quotes. Uh, it's only objection, <clears throat> as he writes to Lucy, it separates me from thee, the dear object of all my earthly happiness. He calls her the charmer of his soul, and you know, beautiful, beautiful expressions. <coughs> well, on the way to Ticonderoga, at the bottom of Lake Champlain, oddly enough, he's courted with a British prisoner named John Andre. John Andre was a, a brilliant 
27-year-old, 27-year-old, who'd been captured by the British. He was a ferocious warrior who was uh, actually educated partially in Geneva, partially in England. Uh, charming, uh, urbane. Uh, for a while, we had a famous love affair with the British. Uh, well, not very long like British poets. And anyway, he and Henry are sort of quartered together because there are not too many lodgings uh, up north at this point. And uh, they discover, even though they're on different sides of the uh, war, they have a lot in common and they talk about literature, business, and arts. And we're going to come back to that later. I think you know this man. Uh, Benedict Arnold was in New Haven, apothecary, uh, kind of self made, um, traded in the West Indies, became rather wealthy. Uh, and became a hero of the revolution. Uh, he fought at uh, Montreal, Quebec. Quebec, he was seriously injured, his left leg shattered. Uh, but he eventually recovered. He hunted all of his soldiers. He clothed them, he fed them, he supplied the money for their armament. He, he thought Congress was going to repay him. A <coughs> uh, famous battle at Dalcor Island in Lake Champlain, a brilliant strategic. Well, escape and really defeat for the British there. Uh, some of you are familiar with military history know, you know about that. And Richfield, Connecticut, and in Saratoga. Now, in Saratoga, he defied Gates. He led forth very aggressively uh, a, a bunch of his men. And actually, he was sort of the key for how Saratoga became uh, the, the turning point of the revolution, the victory. The problem was, in the midst of that very ghastly battle, he again was seriously wounded his leg. His horse had fallen on his leg before. This time his leg was crushed. Um, and he was put in a military hospital for five months. And if you read about it, he's in this funny wooden contraption. It's a contraption. The doctors had wanted to amputate, but Arnold said no. And so by the time he healed, and it took him several years, he was walking with a limp because one leg was shorter than the other. Uh, and his house was, was in very, rather curious for a couple of years after that. Anyway, he also had a bit of a grudge at this point, more than a bit of a grudge, against Congress. And he began to wonder, even after that, maybe those five months in the hospital and what happened after, there's no money coming from Congress to reimburse him and his fortune, he would lay his health was ruined and he was a cripple. He began to wonder whether the revolution was worth it. About 20%, at least, perhaps more, that's a low estimate, of the American colonists did not think the revolution at this point is a good idea. Uh, why shouldn't we? We have this great superpower that was taking care of us. Can't we negotiate a deal with them? They've already come to us a few times and we've rejected them. We're killing our men. The farmlands are scorched. We have widows and orphans. We can't get imported goods. So, it, you know, his view was, well, and he, as I say, he wasn't the only one. He began to think, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't such a great idea, this, this revolution. Well, Lucy is continually, as I say, she's a drama queen. And she's continually, the letters are wonderful. She's continually harping on, and even in the middle of battles, to Henry Knox, where are you? Why aren't you writing? The poor guy has to write from the battlefield sometimes to reassure her. And, and she just can't stand it. Um, that she's always apart from him. And finally, when they're apart for about eight months, she finally begs and pleads. Henry's at the Valley Forge. He does come back here because in this area, in New England, uh, it, there, are, there were munitions factories where they were making guns and cannons and so on and so forth. And he would come back since he had to do this. He was the chief of artillery. And then he would go to Boston to visit Lucy. But Lucy just can't stand not being and so finally, you think about Valley Forge at the end of the, not the, the Valley Forge that you think about, but in the, in the spring, uh, she wants to come. And Henry, has, she's finally broken him down, and he agrees. Now, he had resisted because she had gone to New York before the invasion to be with Henry. And when the British invaded, he had a hustle her out of town. And it was enormous. They had a huge fight all summer. It was terrible letters went back and forth. And he was concerned about her and her baby. But anyway, so he didn't let her near the camp. And yet there were other officers' wives who were there. Um, and of course, Martha came every year uh, in, the, in the winter. And uh, Katie Green came often. Uh, and other officers' wives, some of them lived with But he wouldn't let her come. So she was 
quite angry. Anyway, she happened to know Benedict Arnold. Why? Because Benedict Arnold came to Boston after his uh, leg was still, it was better, but not, and he met a lovely Boston belle who he fell in love with, and he wrote her letters. And, but Lucy was the socially connected one, the elitist, and so he used Lucy as a matchmaker, uh, but, the, but the affair fizzled, and the woman never married her. Anyway, he kind of owed her a favor, and since the generals knew each other, or the high-ranking offices knew each other, he agreed probably to Knox that he would, since he couldn't ride a horse anymore, because he was still so injured, he would take Lucy from New Haven to um, Valley Forge in May, late May, um, and uh, she would be reunited with Henry, and she was. Why did Benedict Arnold want to go to Valley Forge? Because Washington had summoned him. Washington didn't know how really badly injured he was. He thought he was better. He wanted to put him right back to the field as a field commander. I should tell you, Benedict Arnold was very angry also because he is not made a major general for a long time. And younger men are who hadn't fought as many battles, battles and hadn't done as much. So he thinks it's Washington's fault. Of course, Congress said, well, we have to distribute the generalships throughout the colony states, just evenly. So when Benedict Arnold is finally made a major general, they do not announce it publicly. So Benedict Arnold is simmering. And of course, who does he blame? Washington. He thinks Washington has not stood up for him. Now, Washington adores Benedict Arnold. He thinks he's famous. Favorite fighting general, brilliant man, brilliant strategist, which he was, and a great leader of men. His men are always loyal to him when he's in this country. Uh, but Arnold arrives at Valley Forge with Lucy. Lucy and Henry are happily united, and Arnold meets with Washington. And, and Washington says, Well, it's time to put him in the field, and he says, I can't ride a horse. And so Washington knows that, that uh, Philadelphia is going to be uh, evacuated. And he said he needs a peacekeeper there. First there were the Patriots were there, as you know, in the beginning. Then there were the British were there for almost nine months. And now the Patriots are about to come back in. Many people have fled. There are food shortages. The buildings are destroyed. <coughs> the politics are confused. The Quakers, of course, are remaining uh, sort of neutral. Things are pretty bad in Philadelphia. He needs a peacekeeper. So he decides he will appoint Arnold as the peacekeeper, the commandant of Philadelphia. Uh, during that British occupation, Washington, uh, Dower, Philadelphia becomes a playground under the British. The British use that winter for R&R &R and more. They, uh, they make it into a miniature London. They have uh, balls and galas. They open theaters, uh, drinking clubs, more taverns, uh, gaming, uh, horse racing, uh, brothels, <coughs> and um, the girls, the girls have been so deprived, the patriot girls, uh, flocking around these handsome and well-to-do British offices are given beautiful gowns that are imported and all kinds of things. Of course, the Quakers are horrified. Well, among the young ladies uh, is Peggy Shippen. And this is an exaggerated picture. Andre's been free. He's now um, uh, sort of the social director of the British offices. And as I said, he's, he's uh, charming, everybody. He's a bit of a playwright and uh, maybe a bit of a dandy. Some historians thought these two were uh, romantic because he does escort her. Uh, to balls and galas and dinners and whatnot. But, uh, is it, and she does have a lock of his hair in a pendant that she keeps. It's found in her effects at the end of her life. Uh, but they're really just friends, and he's friends with many people in the social circle. He's a flirt. He does have a girlfriend, though, who is Peggy's best friend. He's also an artist, as I say, this is his rendition of Peggy at the Mishanza. Uh, when General Howe is about to leave, which is a grand extravaganza of 24 hours of party uh, on the water, in the state, and everywhere else in Philadelphia. There's huge expenditures of money. And Peggy, along with some of the others, is one of the youngest, she's only uh, 17 here, not quite 17, is, is one of the people who's supposed to be decked out like a lady in a Spanish Harlem, in a Spanish 
Spanish uh, harem, uh, I'm sorry, it's in, in a Middle Eastern or Turkish harem, and this is supposed to be rather risque, this, this dress, and this is supposed to be a, a, a harem headdress, a turban. Um, anyway, uh, it's a bit of a, here she is involved in this, and it's a pageant, uh, and you can read quite a bit about it. This gets her in trouble later on. Anyway, the British evacuate Philadelphia, 1778, June, and Washington, as I say, appoints Arnold the commandant of the city. For Arnold, he says, well, it's a good deal. He gets to keep his army post. He also gets to be a person who can set himself up as important as he loves to be important. He gets the best house in Philadelphia, the Master's Penn Mansion, later because of Washington's headquarters, and he decides to skim off um, British goods and other illegal things before they get to the open market and make himself back some of the money he thinks Congress owes either because he does play both sides of the fence. He's a, quote, neutralist. When the patriots are there in the beginning, he's a patriot. When the British come in, he entertains them and uh, does everything he can to protect his duchy, his townhouse, uh, his position of the uh, judge. He wants to make sure whichever way the wind blows, he's going to make sure he and his family land they're a powerful family. They've been there for over 100 years, famous in law and politics and business. And um, so we call him a neutralist. Now, of course, there are a couple of historic views of Peggy, popular views. One is that she is a sexual siren. And this is a woman who's really a Tory, just like her father. And she's the one who seduces Benedict Arnold, and it's all her fault. And the other one is that she's this sweet, innocent gal who is simply in love with Benedict Arnold and does whatever she needs to do. Um, think about Lucy Lohan or Grace Kelly uh, on one side, and I put her together with uh, Hillary Clinton, and I think you have to hate <laughs> Anyway, Amy's mother, I don't know a lot about. She was the daughter of a, um, an attorney. Uh, and Peggy's father married her. I don't have a lot of information about her, but I do about the judge, besides his political, which is that he adored Peggy. She was his youngest daughter. She was very beautiful. She was quite smart and independent. And he taught her things that you don't teach a well-born young lady. He taught her politics, he taught her finance, and he taught her something about law. So she wasn't just um, sort of a fly-by-night teenager. She had quite a... Um, You'll see later <coughs> substance to her. Anyway, one thing about Peggy, she always got her way. She was daddy's girl, and whenever she didn't get her way as a little girl, and she was the favorite, she had a great technique. She would have hysterics. She would uh, scream and yell and cry. She would stop eating for several weeks. She'd take to her bed, and pretty soon the family would give in, and she'd get her way. And that was her pattern. Anyway, Arnold is um, now commandant, and he is busily doing a lot of illegal things um, that are going on in, in that position. He also was entertaining everybody in his home, and he loved to live high. Uh, he lived extravagantly. He holds balls. He holds dinners. He, uh, he likes to have parties, and he likes to live well. And of course, he eventually meets Peggy. We're not exactly sure in how, exactly how. There are a lot of theories on and they fall in love. Now, Arnold's 37. Peggy is not quite 18. Now, Judge Shippen, as I say, looks a little cagey. This is, he was pretty smart. And he starts, um, nobody accepts his proposal at first, neither Peggy nor, nor uh, the judge. And he starts to sniff around about uh, Arnold's background. And here's some pretty salacious things about Arnold's dealings back in New Haven. And he has a lot of doubts. Number one. There's that. He doesn't even know at this point about what Arnold's doing now. Number two, the man is still not that well. He's hobbling about, of course, addressing his army regalia uh, in, in a white cane, jewel encrusted uh, cane, hobbling about. And, and the ladies are swooning over him. He's talking about his military exploits. And uh, he's considered quite a case of famous. He's called the hero of Freeman Farm. He's called, you know, he's very famous. Uh, the eagle of uh, Saratoga, the hero of the men adore him. He's a national military hero. And Peggy can't resist. 
So, um, it was said by the later relative that had Peggy, had Judge Shippen not given in to her, Peggy would have been in a, quote, dancing fury, end quote. So they do. They get married um, in 1779 at the Shippen House, townhouse on Society Hill, Philadelphia. Uh, however, there is a cloud over that marriage. And uh, the cloud is that now the Patriots have caught, of course, we have very radical Patriots now in Philadelphia, because we've gotten rid of the British and we're going back to where we began with this independence. So uh, anybody who's been a Tory or anybody who's the ladies who had socialized with those British officers all winter are suspect. Anyway, they find out that their wonderful commandant has um, been engaged in military misconduct, using federal uh, property, skimming off money, and so on. And they um, they uh, accused him of eight charges. Arnold was a charming man. He was smart, he was witty, debonair, good looking, but he did not cross from. So he said to uh, the Patriots, okay, let's have a court martial and see whether I'm innocent. And so indeed there was, uh, that court martial didn't take place for a long time, but it hung over the marriage. Uh, it, was a, it was right there. And before the marriage, when Arnold goes to Washington and said, well, let's get on with this court martial. He writes to Peggy, and here it is, a month ago, just a few weeks before their wedding, and he talks about the villainous roads and the villainous men, and this particular line, I have to go back to that, this particular thing, this particular line, he says, I am heartily tired of my journey and also of human nature. And that's just part of the correspondence, but you, you understand the He's pretty disenchanted well before the marriage. And of course, the family closes ranks around him. He couldn't do anything wrong. He's this fabulous general. And as her young cousin said to Peggy, they, they just can't believe that Arnold would be, would have done it. And what demons possess the people with regard to General Arnold? He's much abused ungrateful monsters to attack a character that's been looked up to. And that's the position the ship has taken, at least officially. And so, Peggy and, and Arnold wed. But within a month of his marriage, Arnold has contacted General <coughs> Henry Clinton in British occupied New York and began to offer himself through an operative, through a spy, um, that uh, he will uh, serve as a spy for the Americans and he will do it for a price. Well, Clinton uh, is also, there are at least 500 spies that have been identified in the American Revolution. We know 150 names. I don't know the person who's working on that. There are ways to go with the other names. But um, he's wondering whether this Arnold is a double agent. So he's pretty suspicious. Uh, and, the, and the letters go back and forth and the arguments about money. Arnold's idea is he will defect. He will spill the beans. He will tell everything in his position as, as a general, major general, about the army and, and where the men are where the forts are, and what's provisioned well, and what is not armed well, and if the British will give him 20,000 pounds. And then he will go to England, and he will be regaled as a hero of the revolution, and all these people who are now going to be killed won't be killed, and it will be a good thing. That's, what he, that's his rationale. But the most important thing is the money. And 20,000 pounds in, uh, in the revolution were worth well, well over a million dollars. Probably close to two. And of course, Peggy would go with him. Now, you've read probably uh, Spycraft books, Love of and Clancy, and so on, so many of them today. This is not new. Uh, maybe we're doing it on computer, but in those days, there were other things one did. And of course, one of them uh, was invisible, was uh, ciphers. So you were given, say, Blackstone's um, law book. And you were told to look on a certain page, you just dump this in, in cipher. And you look and so many lines over and so many lines down. You look at the letters, piece it together, and you'll get a message. So that was one way uh, spies communicated with each other. Another one was invisible ink. Two kinds of invisible ink. And most letters had either an F or an A. An F was if you held the letter over fire, you'll see the message. The other one was an A, you could dip it in acid, and the message would come up. And then, of course, the third one were codes, symbols, and so on. 
and a fourth were, um, well, common parlance, common speech, signals. Uh, well, the old lady isn't feeling so well, which, which might have meant something about emissions. Or, uh, well, we had a bright and shiny day uh, with something, and it would, it would be a signal for something else. That was understood. So, and a lot of letters are a little bit, you don't really know which ones are, uh, are informational and which ones are just pleasantries. But these were the four methods. And they were all used by Arnold. He had many archives and so on. Uh, Arnold was traveling in the, in the um, finally, his leg is better. Not completely, but almost. He's traveling in the summer of 1780. And what he wants to do is be commander of West Point. West Point was not, yes, it's a strategic a series of forts, actually, nine could rebend in the Hudson. If uh, the British took that over, they would cut New England off from the Southern uh, Patriots and win the war. You know, there's a chain also, you probably know this, over the Hudson. At certain points where the British ships can't go further up. Anyway, Arnold is, keeps pressing Washington that he wants to be commander of the West Point, which is not considered, you know, the fabulous post for a general who wants to be back in the field. And Washington sees he's well enough to be back in the field, and he can ride a horse again. And Arnold keeps saying no. In fact, whenever it's brought up, Arnold starts looking. So there some notes about that. Washington was perplexed. But ultimately, Arnold does become commander of West Point in the summer of 1780. I want to come back to this other, because I'll tell you why I'm doing these two stories at once. I took an experiment with these two women and these two marriages. Um, Lucy, of course, has continued tirelessly to follow Henry through the army camps. Um, there are fights, there are love mates, uh, love letters, and uh, vexation when the letters don't appear on both sides. He's as demanding as she is. Uh, but she does um, follow him through most of the army camps and live nearby. And one that I just actually went to uh, a couple weeks ago was, it's no longer there, Famous, the Plukeman Artillery King, because Knox's idea was to have a military college. This is the forerunner, of course, of the West Point Military Academy. He felt that the men were never going to win the war unless they were well trained in gunnery and armaments and discipline and so on. And uh, so he established, and here's a, a sketch of it. It's all overgrown today in farms, <coughs> unfortunately. But here's his cupola and his, his academy and the barracks that surround it. And he had, he had quite a this is near um, uh, Middle, Middleburg, Middleton. And um, he, he lives in this little house, the jacket is the end of your house at that time, with Lucy and uh, their children. It looks bigger than it is, and it's just there, it's very small. Uh, and here it is, the jacket is the end of your house. Now, Lucy has another child uh, named Julia, and Lucy feels so well after this. Uh, after this baby is born, she goes to the nearby army camp to watch uh, a military parade for the French general. And uh, comes back, and within a few days, she is seriously ill and she turns yellow. Uh, probably hepatitis, probably from dirty water, and probably from her time in the army camp. She becomes sick, the children become sick, and the newborn baby dies, Julia. And there's a whole story which Michael goes into, but the larger point is that is, is only the second of Lucy's pregnancies. Lucy has 13 children. And um, 10 of them die. Yeah, uh, not a, only three survive to adulthood. Now, all of them don't die during the revolution, but a number of them do. Disease, accident, and so on. And she really has a sad life, um, despite her. But she's, she's a social leader. After all, she's elite. She knows the proper things to do. She's the one who, uh, in the Grand Alliance Ball, is a celebration of uh, this time. Uh, Grand Alliance Ball, celebration of a year anniversary of the French Alliance. She's nine months pregnant, and she and, and Washington opened the ball, presumably with a minuet. It's about three weeks later that she, she, did a, she uh, delivers uh, for that child, Julia. But she becomes really an icon of the revolution. She's always there. She is cheerful. Mostly she deals with the officers and their wives, not the common soldiers. But um, she is always, almost always there, except during times of battle. Anyway, here we are in August 1780. 
Arnold is commander of West Point, and he has it all figured out. He's, he's in secret operation, secret codes, and whatnot with Andre, who is the adjutant general under uh, Clinton, and he's going to, still negotiating money, still arguing about the money. Clinton's still a little suspicious, is this a double agent? But Arnold is now prepared to give Andre, if they could only meet on the Hudson, uh, all the information he needs about West Point and the armaments all up and down the Hudson, and, and he even pumps, even pumps Knox for more information. He's a couple of letters about that. And of course, he arranges for, um, for Peggy to come to the home they rent, which is just south of West Point. The plan being, once he's given papers to uh, Andre, and Andre goes back to the British, and they see it's for real, they will welcome him, he will escape onto the Hudson onto a ship, he will go to New York with Peggy, and they will be regaled as hero and heroine, and collect their money, and live happily ever after. Uh, sometimes when he's traveling, he can't send those letters. And we know that Andre knew about Mrs. Arnold, but that was his old friend Peggy from Philadelphia. And we also know from some famous letters that Peggy was uh, that fourth kind of spy work that I was telling you about, the social, looks innocent, was were really more signals. We also know she passed papers for Arnold uh, to Clinton and to Andre, that she was directly involved. Well, Andre does meet Arnold on the shores of the Hudson. Now, Clinton had said to him, three things you can't do. You cannot go into enemy territory. You as an officer cannot change out of your uniform and get in disguise. And thirdly, do not take any incriminating papers with you, because if you get caught, you will be hanged as a common spy. Common soldier, not an officer and a gentleman. And Andre agreed, however, through a series of uh, coincidences and carelessness, uh, and the story you'll have to read it, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, Andre is brought by one of Arnold's assistants through enemy territory in disguise. The papers are foisted upon him, all the information about West Point, which Andre, being very nervous about what had happened, because he has no choice, is kind of trapped in enemy territory, are stuffed into his boots. And just as the Assistant leads him near British territory. They part. Andre is captured by three people who may or may not have been patriots. They were what's called cowboys, and kind of lawless. But anyway, they eventually find one of them can read, and they pull the papers out of his boots, and they see that these are military secrets. And so they bring it to the Patriot Army camps, and the officers right to guess who. They write to the highest person who's involved in that area, the highest commander. Well, who is that? It's Arnold. Arnold is back home with Peggy. Arnold is horrified. I'm going to come back to the slide in a minute. Arnold escapes. What he does is he receives this letter just as Washington is coming to inspect West Point the very morning. In fact, Lafayette, Knox, and Hamilton are already in the Arnold home waiting for Peggy to come downstairs and have breakfast. Washington let them go ahead because he said, all you young, all young men are in love with Peggy. Arnold gets this letter. And about three minutes later, according to the account, two minutes later, they said that Washington would be there at any moment. Arnold runs upstairs to Peggy and basically says, we've been caught. Immediately, he runs downstairs, runs to the shores of the Hudson, and insists that his oarsmen at gunpoint row him to the British ship, the Vulture, man of war. One historian, Wag, said, it's one Vulture for me and another. <laughs> Peggy is left behind. Well, she's a person of interest, as we would put it today. And she thinks fast, because obviously she's <coughs> going to be implicated. And there's only one thing to do. Now, you've seen pictures of Peggy, at least one of them you've seen. And she's coiffured and taken care of and beautifully dressed and careful about herself. 
she decides that she can go in one second. She is going to go insane from the shock of Arnold's betrayal to her, to the country. She never knew anything about it, and she does. It's the performance of her life. And by the time Washington has come, she has ripped her clothes, and she is screaming and yelling and frothing at the mouth and taking to the bed and not recognizing anybody and screaming about Arnold's betrayed her and what a terrible thing so on and so forth. And Arnold, uh, Washington believes her. Hamilton believes her. He even writes to his fiance about it. Knox believes her. Lafayette believes her. And so, two days later, she is allowed, poor innocent thing, to go back by stagecoach to Philadelphia. Now, the whole country is on red alert because who knows what the British know? And are we going to be attacked? But people also, because they know about Arnold, they will not allow her to stop at an inn to get food or drink. There's only one place that she goes where she's welcomed, and that's part of another fascinating story. I'm going to come back to that other slide. Here is Andre. This is a gentleman and an officer of the highest rank. People adored him. Even Hamilton was admired him for his gentility. He never accused Arnold of carelessness. He, he, he said, it's my fault, essentially. And he is, therefore, Clinton, um, there's talk of exchanging Arnold for Andre, and Clinton has an agonizing decision. And he is very close to Andre, but he decides that if he exchanges Arnold for Andre, then nobody will spy on the British again. And so Andre is taken to a court martial, and he is tried as a common spy. This is another picture he did of himself, or a number of them, of the night before his, his death. He is finally hanged as a common spy on October 2nd for violating the international rules of law. Peggy is just about returning to Philadelphia at that time. So not only is her husband British occupied New York. She is back with her parents, but Andre is now dead. She takes to her bed. Her parents believe she's absolutely innocent, of course. She takes to her bed for weeks. Uh, they say the country's on red alert, and if you look at military records, you will not find any mention of Benedict Arnold. He's stripped from every military record in this country um, as a traitor. There are, in his hometown of North Carolina, there are people who turn over the gravestones of his father and his brother. There are riots all over the country. Um, this is just one of the many political cartoons. Here's uh, Arnold and the devil and the pot of gold okay, that he's out after, which is what they think he's all only he's about after. And there are a number of floats. Here's one of Arnold, which I think this is Philadelphia. Here he is two-faced, two masks, a dummy, holding the bag of gold and Satan. It is said that this, this uh, float, there were others all over the country, uh, it is said that they then burned this effigy of Arnold near the ship and household. So Peggy's in disgrace. Uh, Peggy is still pretending she's totally innocent. But the Patriots find one of those social letters of hers written to Andre called the Millinery Letter, in which they suddenly resumed relations about cat goods that Andre is going to send her for New York, the Millinery Letter. And uh, the Supreme Executive Council, the Patriots, who run Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, really, decide that Peggy has to be exiled. And so in early November, her father takes her to the shores of the Hudson with her infant son and watches her um, cross the water to British-occupied New York. Um, the brides after the revolution, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story because it gets even better, believe it or not. Uh, you'll have to read the book. Um, and it's on Kindle as well, by the way. Um, but it, to me, it's a cautionary tale about love, marriage, and character. And while you, can, while you may think, well, which one of these two is more worthy, I'm going to leave it to you because it's very interesting. But I, I wanted you to see this picture, done in England, of Peggy with her first son, Edward, somewhat later in life. 
Uh, we do not have an image of Lucy. All we have is this silhouette from the Boston Historical Society. And Lucy was quite large, as I say. She got larger over the years. There are a lot of comments from uh, a lot of the French, particularly about, and, and some Americans later, about her here. She wore it during the Revolution as a tri-corner hat, all built up. And, you know, how she got this hat on, I have no idea. <laughs> The only picture, the only image we have of uh, Lucy. Divine Brides examines not just what I just told you about the revolution, but the subsequent evolution of uh, these two women from Duke Island, teenagers into sturdy women, mothers and wives, during an extraordinary historical period. But like most 18th century women, the stories were nearly forgotten. Recorded history and their voices considered, if you look in most, it, even modern history books, just footnotes to American history. Some people have asked me where I did my research. This is, uh, these are the places that I did most of it. Mass Historical, Gilda Lerman had digitized 8,500 Knox's letters, which was great. I didn't have to look at them on microfilm. I would have taken me a number of lifetimes. Uh, many letters in there from Lucy and the Library of Congress, of course, has a lot of military history and a great deal of information about the, the war. Uh, Pennsylvania Historical Society, the General Henry Knox Museum in Maine, uh, and Clifford in Philadelphia. Uh, the National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, had some good letters between Henry and, uh, and Lucy and then Lucy's family. Uh, and in New Brunswick, a number of different archives there. Uh, where the Arlots lived for a while, and in England, uh, and in St. Mary's Church of Addison, which is a whole other fascinating story about the, uh, the graves of the Arnolds. I just want to leave you with one comment, and uh, Peggy, who is mad about her husband, crazy for him, sick with love for him in the beginning, writes many, many years later to her sister, marriage is but a lottery. <laughs> Thank you.